Welcome to another edition of my Fireside Chat. The Delta State University Colloquia Distinguished Speakers Lecture Series continued this past week with special guest United States Congressman Benny Thompson of Mississippi. Congressman Thompson's speech, a look back at the 2016 national election, gave our faculty, staff, students, and community a unique opportunity to discuss last Tuesday's national election. Representative Thompson is a native of Bolton, Mississippi, and a product of the Hines County School District. He later earned his undergraduate degree from Tougaloo College and his master's degree from Jackson State University. After graduating from college, he followed his mother's footsteps and worked as a school teacher for a while before pursuing a career in government and politics. He has served the second congressional district since 1993 and is the longest serving African American elected official in the state of Mississippi and the longest serving member of the United States House of Representatives from our state. He also serves as the ranking minority member of the House Homeland Security Committee. Congressman Thompson, thank you for joining us today and congratulations on your re-election. Thank you very much. It's an exciting time I know for election, although there were mixed results this year with the national election. Well, you're correct, but as you know, in America, whatever differences we have, we sell them at the ballot box. There you go. Uh, uh, people have spoken, and so we move on. What lessons can we take away? What takeaway is there from this national election cycle uh, in your mind, looking back at what happened, what the results were, uh, and where we're going as a country? What, what takeaway is there? Well, first of all, uh, on both sides, Democrat, Republican, I think there was an uneasiness about the tone. Uh, people really wanted to get into the issues facing America and the world rather than the personal destruction uh, one candidate against the other. Mm -hmm. So you had some real hard feelings that uh, came out uh, because of that. Uh, some people turned off uh, the campaigns, especially millennials. Uh, they kind of felt that neither one of the candidates was speaking to them. So many of them just went about their normal business on election day. Uh, so I say hopefully uh, we've learned to be uh, more respectful of our opponents uh, when you are involved in a campaign uh, because after all the public's watching and so we have to uh, try to set a standard that will, will serve us well. Any prediction for any change, perhaps, in the political climate in Washington, given a new administration and a, a new start with a new Congress in January? Well, you know, every new president that I've uh, served on, and this will be my, my fourth, uh, they all come in with high expectations. Uh, and at some point, those expectations get confronted with reality. Uh, the government is big. The process for which decisions are made in government is long, laborious, cumbersome. And so a businessman who runs his or her own businesses can make decisions like that because there's no one else to, to object. If they do, you fire them. Uh, however, a president has 100 members of the Senate and 435 members uh, of the House. And in those respects, um, uh, you have to kind of be able to tell the pulse of the institution. Mm -hmm. And uh, in time, they'll learn. As a former staffer on Capitol Hill in both the House and the Senate, I I recall the, the swing and the flow from majority to minority whenever one party would lose. And it's disappointing when you're not in the majority, you're not quite there with the chairmanships and that sort of thing. You were privileged to serve as the very first chairman of the Homeland Security Committee as a Democrat and have had a lot to do with, with Homeland Security ever since then. Uh, how do you see the role of uh, your leadership and your committee going forward and dealing with uh, your House colleagues uh, 
even though you're still in the minority, there's a huge voice there. Some people sure. don't understand that. Tell us a little bit about well, that. Well, you know, we're all Americans, and we just happen to be of different parties. Uh, on the Homeland Security Committee, if a flood comes, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or Republicans, you have American citizens who are at risk. So we have to activate our emergency response system to help our citizens. Um, for new members who come in kind of with a partisan uh, tilt, it's, it's instructive once they find out that the water doesn't go down the Republican street uh, rather than the Democratic street or down the Democratic street and not the Republican street, just goes down the street. And so our policies have to be balanced based on uh, who our people are. Uh, everybody comes in wanting to cut taxes. Well, you've heard that term NIMBY, not in my backyard. Well, when you say uh, we want to cut taxes, and then you say, okay, tell me what we need to cut. I said, well, uh, and what are we going to replace the revenue that we cut? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, whatever taxes we cut, we're going to have to cut services an equal amount. So now you need to tell me what services we can do without. And that's what happens when the NIMBY syndrome takes an impact because if I have to cut health services, the hospitals and the doctors and the nurses will, will complain. So we have to put that back. If we cut uh, military, then the soldiers and the generals and the, uh, the manufacturers of weapons, they're going to complain. So you got to have a balance on whatever public policy you're putting together because there are no democratic uh, soldiers and republican soldiers, they're just soldiers. And, and there's no such thing as a democratic tax cut and a republican tax cut. So I think it's instructive for new people that once they finally get that. Uh, for instance, we are an agricultural uh, uh, based economy here in the second district. Well, p it's always easy to pick on a family uh, that's on food stamps. So, well, you know, I see these people in the store and they buying all this and they're not doing anything. Well, they have to qualify. And once you look at the programs, you have to be in a work training program, uh, there's a maximum limit that you can be on the program. But if you see the billions of dollars that's spent in the program in grocery stores, but you follow it down, you see the farmers who raise corn and rice and many of the products that those food stamps buy, you know, you, you, you got to have a marriage between the nutrition programs and a traditional agriculture program because without one, you can't have the other. And, and you tell individuals, say, okay, which one we gonna cut? <laughs> well, let's cut the, the food stamps, okay. So what are we gonna do with all this rice and, and all this corn that's stored? Who's gonna buy it? <laughs> they said, what you mean? I said, well, you know, <laughs> it can only stay there so long before it goes bad. And then they said, you know, we never thought of that. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the balance. And that's where the economy of the Delta and the, 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 the urban environment with the numbers who participate in the program, that's why you can have a balance between a traditional agricultural program with, with urban beneficiaries greater than, than the rural. So, so that's how you do public policy. All right. and, and so for, for a newbie coming there, uh, it's a quick lesson. I guess it is. And as a veteran uh, legislator, uh, with all the years under your belt, you have an opportunity to mentor some of the freshmen coming in who come in with a, a 
bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and they're going to cha change the world. and Overnight. That's right. They don't <laughs> overnight, and they don't understand that uh, these things have to be balanced, and that uh, the age-old dilemma of informed opinion versus public opinion that you wrestle with every day in policy mm -hmm. making. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a challenge, and I know it is a challenge mm -hmm. for you all up there. But looking forward at the next Congress that cranks up in January, what do you think the major legislative initiatives will be, and what will you be putting your name to and your efforts to through your committees? Well, we have to have some kind of an infrastructure bill, uh, uh, roads, bridges, uh, our locks and dam systems uh, all across the country have long since passed their uh, uh, lifespan. So we don't have to invest in it. Now whether we call it a tax to finance that or, or a fee to finance it, it will require revenue and we're going to have to do it. So. Some people are saying, well, if we had the program, it's also a jobs program. They said, oh yeah, that's right. Said, because if we're building highways, it would take people to build it. So we'll have to do that. Uh, we'll talk about the affordability of college, which as you know, uh, for institution like Delta State, uh, for your students to come and, and, and get that quality education, there's investment. A lot of people are now saying that the affordability question uh, for a, a college education uh, should not become a weight around the neck of the students if they graduate. And you know what I'm talking about is, is the enormous amount of debt associated with it. And so we're looking at potential changes so that we can minimize the debt of students who go to college, uh, either through uh, reducing the interest rate on the loans, not allow the interest rates to start until the student completes college, uh, uh, because we're not in the business of making money as a government off the backs of our students. We shouldn't be, but we are. Uh, we've made over $50 million last year mm. on our student loan program. That doesn't make sense. I think we could lose money on a student loan program and it would still be a good investment. Uh, if banks are paying 25.25% rate on a certificate of deposit, why should a student pay 6% on a student loan? Why can't we have the, the CD rate <laughs> being the loan rate for a student loan? Makes sense. At least it wouldn't be as much as what students are paying now. So we had to look at it. Public service. Some people are saying we could put a public service component into the student uh, loan program so that a student could uh, uh, just like in certain areas where you can teach. Mm -hmm. They just need to expand it to include other areas. Because right now, you know, you're kind of tied right into that education component. But what if I wanted to be a social worker? Uh, what if I wanted to be an entertainment uh, media person? Uh, why shouldn't I be able to demonstrate my talents in an area and get the credit uh, off my student loan when I do that. So, so people are talking about a lot of things. Uh, uh, the criminal justice reform. Uh, that same student who would want to come to Delta State can't qualify uh, for a student loan if they have a felony on their criminal record. So a lot of our young people get drug offenses and other things on their record get themselves back straight. I'm a believer in second and third chances. Why can't we take that prohibition off of that student loan program for on, on the criminal justice reform? Uh, why can't we give them the right to vote back? I've served my time, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
we let sinners come to church and they have all the benefits of every other member once they confess their sins. So if I do my time, I should have every right restored back to me as a citizen. Uh, in some countries, as you know, uh, people who are in jail still vote. They never lose the right to vote. So I think there are a lot of things we need to look at uh, under this area. Uh, uh, you can't go into military service with a criminal record. I don't know why not. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just a lot of things we look at that we need to take a second look. So I'm looking forward to going uh, uh, back uh, under President Trump and, and do my best to work with him. Uh, but also educate him that, um, you know, it's a big world. Uh, it's a diverse world. Uh, and we can't build walls. Uh, we ought to be building bridges uh, so that we can communicate and, and work with one another. Uh, that we can't denigrate people based on religion, uh, national origin, uh, anything like that. We need to work with them. And I think that's why a school like Delta State is so important because you look at your student enrollment and you kind of like the melting pot of the world. And I think that melting pot experience will make the student body here uh, match any other student body uh, uh, in this country. And so that kind of opportunity is something we should never uh, reduce uh, or cease to allow to exist because, you know, it's a big world and it, it is just not the United States of America, you know, it's the world and, and, and we need to, to, to understand that. You bet. We are the most diverse university in the state and we're proud of that. Uh, multicultural identity here is something that we value very highly. And you're, you're great to remind us that uh, college affordability and college accessibility are important ingredients, and we strive hard to keep our tuition low here for that reason because of the population we're serving. So uh, we appreciate any help we can get from Washington, mm -hmm. that's for sure, mm -hmm. on that. Finally, um, would you have any uh, advice for our students who might be looking in at this blog that comes out for them uh, on the value of higher education and what it means? <coughs> You've been there and you know the value. and uh, any good piece of advice for them? Well, to the extent that you can, you should see the, the opportunities here at Delta State as the beginning uh, to your new endeavor in life. To the extent that you fulfill that while you're here, you'll be a better person. Uh, technology is important. Uh, the understanding of diverse cultures and mores uh, of the student body here will make you a better person uh, once you matriculate from Delta State because you will then uh, already have familiarities with uh, people who are a little different than, than just native Mississippians. Uh, and to the extent that you can avoid the peer pressure of not being uh, accepted because you didn't do something foolish, uh, because some things will follow you uh, long after you leave Delta State. And again, nobody's perfect, but to some degree, by the time uh, one would leave here, you would expect them to have the ability to make adult decisions. And it's the preparation that they receive here that would create uh, that opportunity for maturity. That's great advice. We really appreciate your coming back to campus 
as uh, hopefully a frequent visitor to speak to our students and faculty and staff. Uh, thank you for what you do for the 2nd Congressional District and being a friend of Delta State. And congratulations again on your re-election. Thank you much. Thanks for being with us. In other news on campus, students are encouraged to attend the Statesman Connect and Graduate Studies Career Fair this Wednesday from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the state room of the H.L. Niles Student Union. This is a great opportunity to network with potential employers and to find out more about graduate school options. And classes will not take place next week so that students and faculty and others can travel home for the Thanksgiving holidays. Administrative offices will remain open through Wednesday and will be closed on Thursday and Friday. And of course, you can keep up with all of our news and events and activities on campus by visiting our website at deltastate.edu. Thanks again for joining me. I'll see you the next time on another edition of Fireside Chat.